Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of the Embracing Brokenness podcast. So glad you could join us. We're going to do something a little different, interrupt our normally programmed schedule of podcasts to bring you this. Colleen and I will have a discussion about a recent trip that we took to Denver, Colorado. We were visiting family, but we also had the opportunity to stop in to visit with our new friends at the Other Side Academy. And if you've tracked with us last year, you know I had Joseph Grenny on. He and his wife, Sheila, founded the Other Side Academy. So we want to talk about what that looks like in this classic therapeutic community. And if you're not sure what that is, stay tuned. Here's a little bit of a preview, and we'll be right back. If you knew how to go to work, that's where you'd be. Let's transition. 30, 60, 90 day model, residential. In most cases, you go there, your pants are sagging, your hat's on crooked. 90 days later, you've white knuckled it. You're clean and sober for 90 days. Now it's time to go out into the real world and get a job. You have no idea how to be on time. You have no idea how to follow simple instructions. Punch out at five, not 459, and be a good employee. If we knew how to do that, that's what we'd be doing. So in many of these models, they don't teach you that piece. And it is critical because most of us, like myself, who was out of the workforce for decades, had no idea how to work. When you talk about the social enterprises at the Other Side Academy, the moving company, number one rated moving company in the entire state of Utah. In 2018, we won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneurs of the Year with a moving company ran by ex-felons and ex-drug addicts. We have two large thrift stores. We call them the Other Side Thrift Boutiques. When you walk in, you'll think you're at Macy's or Nordstrom's. The other side storage, moving company, thrift store and storage. They all dovetail nicely together. Most people who move have stuff they want to donate to the thrift store and they need to store stuff at our storage. But the more important piece is this. When I was going to jail, who was paying for me? You were. I was a burden. When I was going to prison, who was paying for me? You were. I was a burden. When I'm going to a program I can't pay for. Who's paying for me? Somebody else. I was a burden. For some reason, we want to get away from that accountability, but we need to be accountable to that. I was a burden on my family. I was a burden on the community. I was a burden on the taxpayer. I was a burden. The day the student comes to the Other Side Academy, the day they get there, they become part of the solution, not the problem. Shouldn't I be responsible for fixing my life? I broke it. Shouldn't the other students be responsible for fixing their lives? They broke them. Sure, there are things in our past that led us to making those decisions. But what happened to me when I was six has nothing to do with me today at 55. What happened to me when I was 12 has nothing to do with me when I'm 30. Ultimately, I'm not responsible for the cards I was dealt when I was a child, but I am responsible to reshuffle that deck as an adult. You should not have to pay for my bad decisions. I should be held responsible for them. We generate our own revenue through our social enterprises that allows us to do the work and keep the students in the mode of practice every day without charging them anything to be here. That's why the social enterprises are so important. The students can stay as long as they need to. We're not taking any money from the government and you get to learn how to get up every day, go to work, be a good employee, follow simple instructions, be honest, have a good attitude, go to bed, rinse and repeat. That's why it's important. So I said in the opening, the Other Side Academy, it's a classic therapeutic community. And what's interesting about that, and when we got a chance to visit there, you could see it in the people. It was, it was a beautiful thing, right? To be right. able to watch individuals who had not only been through the program, but also successfully sort of managed through a pretty interesting way of doing things like you get to see it firsthand right so what i um what i mean by that is for for many of our listeners and, and in our audience that don't understand this that um this whole model was based on um the community being basically peers right so they're working with individuals that um, instead of employing therapists for example or doctors mm -hmm. these are people that actually 
have gone through a pretty critical time in their life where they've found ways to mm -hmm. to get on top of their addictions, their issues, whether it's experiencing homelessness, it's part of it, but mm -hmm. this is also a jail diversion program, mm -hmm. the Other Side Academy. And you have a lot of experience in this area, but, but both in working with those people that have experienced homelessness and also as a therapist, in mm -hmm. a social worker and people, and someone who did therapy with individuals. How critical is that? That seems to be a really important part of, of a recovery program or a program like this, therapeutic mm -hmm. community, where everybody's working together to make mm -hmm. for common ground. They say one, their number one thing on their list is you alone can't do it, but you can't do it alone. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of principles that tie in here. Um, first and foremost, let me say I love therapeutic communities, true therapeutic communities. Um, they have been, I think, if you look at even AA, what, why it's been so successful, and it's not hugely, I mean, everybody does not go through AA and come out not being addicted to something. But what is successful, I think, is some of the core principles of AA were around developing that sense of community of like-minded people who had a goal of staying sober. And so you were able to develop those kinds of relationships. Toza just takes that to a whole different level. And again, the traditional therapeutic communities that are evidence-based and in the late 60s and 70s um, ran in some very different ways than how we would see a therapeutic community today. I love when we walked in there, you could feel it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was incredible that they have developed a model that is tried and true to what the intent was of a true therapeutic community. Well, I think what um, was stuck with me too was that, that there was a discipline that you could see among um, not only the people that were you know, in operations and that have mm -hmm. been there for a long, long time, but just the... Mm -hmm the students right mm -hmm. there there were there was a kindness yet there was a there was a discipline and you could see in the community showing up like we walked mm -hmm. in the front door mm -hmm. and they were waiting for us it was mm -hmm. we were on time for a scheduled appointment mm -hmm. to tour their facility and meet with some of their leadership mm -hmm. and there they were waiting greeting us students and then one of the uh, program directors one of the people that are there on, on the spot I, I, you're right. I loved it. And the bench. So we'll talk mm -hmm. about the bench, right? We got Wasn't it so neat? One thing that I really, really loved is we had three people standing in front of mm -hmm. us to greet us. They didn't tell us who they were, like their titles or any no. of that right away. I mean, we, we learned that. But we had three people. We didn't know who's in the program. We didn't know are these three staff members. Right. There was such just mutual respect mm -hmm. um, and also a sense of purpose. Like there was something they were gonna yeah. do and they wanted to impart to us, you know, about their community, incredible pride yes. in their community, incredible enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, when we realized who the program director was, uh, she stepped out of the room for a minute and we got a chance to talk to, um, to yeah. other gentlemen, and then we could identify who was who, but um, everyone had equal passion to share this incredible secret that they had found that was radically changing their lives. That was just amazing. It was. They took us into a small room. We all sat down. It was very yep. friendly. You could see the, the approach, even for somebody coming on their campus for the first time, yep. how they would be treated with Absolutely. respect and with dignity. and. And we had a little dog called Denver. Oh, I love Denver. <laughs> Following us around. Oh, and to think, we, we need to explain the bench when you come okay, in. We, but to think that Denver, and this I love about dogs as, you know, therapeutic agents, yeah. agents of change, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, is that to find out that Denver would go to new people and sit at their feet while they were deciding if they wanted to do this program sitting on the bench yes. which was part of their process and sometimes they had to sit there for like two hours to mm -hmm. say are we really willing to make this commitment and when i heard that denver sat there they weren't talking to other people going by they were supposed to really be self-reflecting on do i really want to do this that here they have this beautiful little companion 
who is just present with them. A boxer, right? Denver was a boxer. Yeah, Denver was yeah, a boxer. He, he just followed us everywhere during oh, the whole tour. You Denver can see, just so he, he loves it. Yeah. yeah, and and sitting on the bench is such an important part because what they they say is we want to we want a bench in every city around mm -hmm. the world that wants one. Yeah, and I think that's really a cool way to look at it. They have three uh, locations right now that are. Um, that were the founders, mm -hmm. um, you know, initiated, but mm -hmm. but they're partnering with people all over the world to try to make this make this work yes. in other ways. So I love, yeah. I mean, just walking in the door, you had a sense, which is funny because we ended up driving up to this location, which was our daughter was my, with us, and she said. Um, Man, this is close to where we got married. <laughs> and before you know, we're driving up, and there it was it was the venue that they got married. Yeah, in. it was amazing that they converted that they converted, wedding venue, big mansion, into uh, Tosa, yeah, Denver. They did it in twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah it and great. it was incredible. So part of <laughs> our distraction was we wanted to see how they yeah. changed up the wedding venue because oh, yeah. it was only five years ago that we were there. You know, yeah, exactly. for Steph's wedding. So yeah, that was that was really really. That was a highlight. That was a highlight. It was. Um, so so yeah, I I think that just the initial impression of walking in the door, mm -hmm. you could see that, um, and it was spotless. Yeah. And all the students are responsible for maintenance and taking care of things and cleaning things. And we you know we got a chance to walk into the kitchen and just see how immaculate it all was. And just and as you saw in the video opening, mm. the social uh, pr the programs that the basically the the. Um, the places they are employed, yeah, uh, that are run by Tosa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're they're in Denver. They have a furniture store. They're just opening, mm -hmm. so it's not a thrift store, but it's a furniture store. Yeah, that sounds really neat. Uh, which really sounds more like a it, furniture boutique. Yeah, I but think, the, yeah, yeah, it yeah. sounds like much more kind of upscale, classy, and following their what I would say from ob observing them is like just unbelievable customer service approach. Yeah, which yeah. is, I mean. They've won awards for that. I think we, we saw that earlier in the video of the awards that they've won. Number one um, moving company, not just in Salt Lake City, but the one in Denver also. Wow. Like five, like, that's like 500 five star reviews. So if you live yeah. in Denver or Salt Lake <laughs> and you need yeah. moved, go there. Yeah. Uh, Let, let's divert for one minute because what was really interesting is, you know, you and I both came, we were so impressed. Yeah. Um, and would love to help put a bench in every city that wants one. I mean, the model is incredible um, and so we came back and we did even more research we right. dug into a white paper that they had mm -hmm. written um, we looked all over their website and one thing that was fascinating was kind of these myths that mm -hmm. they wanted to dispel you know they do not take government funding right. and i think it's the number one reason that they actually can have a true therapeutic community because mm -hmm. the government when you take government funds it shifts to what they think is important and they sh you know, move and move and move these programs down in time and tell you you can do this or you can't do that. Hmm. And really government money comes with a lot of sc strings that actually, uh, my personal opinion, make you adopt a, a victim mentality. In fact, really true as hmm. we're looking at issues with like kids today, We've turned all of them into everybody needs a therapist because you're a victim of something. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, but f to not do that um, and to not take the government funding, you've got to find a way to fund yourself. So what's interesting is they are a work-based program, okay. you know, with the social enterprise mm -hmm. and they're criticized because they don't pay their staff <laughs> or not their staff, I'm sorry. The they students. don't pay the students for working there, which totally cracks me up. I mean, and this is where there is such a miss mm -hmm. in developing, quite frankly, decent human beings. And when you're Christians, people made in the image of God, right? Mm -hmm. Like they clearly there was demonstrated, there was no male or female, there was, I mean, we were just children of God there, right? Like mm -hmm. I think the model of, you know, we're all the same was really, really cool. Great principle there. Um, but I think another principle, we see it straight in Genesis 1. In fact, in the first, God is creating and we're called to create. Creation, creating is labor. And so this whole thing of keeping people not laboring really defies the image of God in them. So. They get labor, right? So now do you pay everybody? 
Well, you know, if they would really um, actually print up a bill mm -hmm. that would show the services that they received from, you know, everything, the classes, the uh, labor training, the room and board, you know, like you think about all the things. If they were handed a bill, oh, yeah. they could never afford to pay that no. bill with the work they were doing if it was even at better than you know or even um, living wage yeah it's just wait, yeah you yeah can't, especially so, in, a, in a city like denver which right. we all understand oh, how expensive it is to live there and it's yeah. a beautiful look it's almost oh, like my. bunk style living so yeah. it was fun to watch like see how they all live you know there's there was roughly i think 60 to 70 students yeah and they're ready to double the size of the campus through some buildings that mm -hmm. they acquired right around there yeah so i think you're right the 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 fact that they work uh hard Yes. to learn how to work hard because many many of the folks we're talking about here have struggled for decades mm -hmm. uh one of the one of the young men that we met there yeah in and out of prison for how long and how many situations that he found himself in mm -hmm. um it, it, it was just one thing after the other and you know i loved how they even the, the director there lola just, it just goes into the community and talks yeah. with uh, community leaders but also meets with uh, local the, the the district attorneys and mm -hmm. the judges so that they that that you know they're they understand what's available to mm -hmm. divert people from a lifestyle yeah. that would continue to to derail everything that yes. in them that god created and so i think yeah people come up with different reasons to criticize i think mm -hmm. that for the most part you're going to find every student there is happy to be where they oh, are and doing on. what they're doing it's amazing it, it is beautiful and i and i look at that criticism and and you can see how far society's come from even the respect that we give to people who are struggling with different forms of addiction you know as if they're less than i think that you know to say no you're the same as everybody else we're going to work we're right. going to do this but the investment in the way they rebuild that life you know from somebody who's just coming in with incredible brokenness like yeah. we really we could yeah. really relate to that so i want to break down uh if you go to the website folks mm -hmm. we're going to give you in the show notes you'll see a, a link to this to the website but also mm -hmm. a place you can support this uh, operation because there the, the budget is is a substantial amount especially for you know the campuses they have located in these major cities mm -hmm. But it's not as much as you would think it would be and they just but they really would appreciate your support but i want to break this down right mm -hmm. so it's a as we said earlier comprehensive it's a two-year residential program mm -hmm. and then followed by six months of a transitional program mm -hmm. back into society if they choose although they have the option to stay as long as they want yes that's interesting you would mm -hmm. think well there might be a few po folks that would look at this as an opportunity just to stay for next to nothing but mm -hmm. i don't but that's not what the experience shows with mm -mm. with the numbers mm -mm. they've been very successful if somebody anybody stays for at least two years well let's just say for a two-year period mm -hmm. the recidivism rate is really low i mean the, mm -hmm. their success rate let's put it that way is something like what 80 80 plus percent i think it was i didn't uh, i didn't there write two all years. the numbers down but it was interesting to see um, even post-graduation yeah. or after the program in transition. I mean, their they're numbers for uh, not going back into, I'll call it criminological behavior. So they're, they don't, they're not reincarcerated, um, was in the high 80s. Yeah. Um, continuing to work was at least high 70s, early 80s and not relapsing i think was probably in the 80s i mean those, those numbers are unheard, yeah, it's unheard of, of honestly yeah. that so. it's incredible but i think did you hear um dave in the video mm -hmm. that that we showed at the very beginning um he said something that kind of cracked me up because i'm like he's so right and he said 30 60 90 days you can white knuckle through that and <laughs> now you're supposed to be clean right yeah, yeah. um but I mean, people weren't taught basic skills. You know, I used to say um, the things that I would find in this kind of population that dovetails in, you know, we had in the homeless community in particular, um, we had individuals with addictions and, you know, criminal backgrounds and mental health that kind of overlapped a lot of that. Um, and, you know, the first thing that came in our door they needed to feel like they were a human being. Right. That restoration of 
you know, of self-esteem and identity, but they were so lacking hope. They had never seen hope. Some were born, you know, in a lower socioeconomic class. They had never had hope. So till you like develop things, it takes a long time. We're talking mm -hmm. basic skills. And so the fact that their program is a length of time that actually allows them to develop those things is the reason you can get those kinds of outcomes because our our typical i mean our traditional model now of drug and alcohol is usually 30 days um very few times do you find transition or halfway houses that have the structure needed right. to build people up and so you just have this vicious cycle of people going to rehab over and over and over again because you know you saw one tiny little part of the problem but the whole big picture um, needs to be addressed. Well, unfortunately, the demand for those services is overwhelming now, even yes. since COVID. That there's the the addiction numbers are off the charts, and right. even for mental health um, help. Correct. You know, and I'm not believing. I'm not sure. You know what the all qualifications are for TOSA, but I would think you, you know there has to be some level of um, ability to work and do the things you need to do to recover from sure, something like this. Sure. So it's not just anyone can come in and join the program, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's pretty impressive when you look at, I think actually if what they told us there is if you stayed for three years or close to three years, the success rate got into the nineties. Yeah. I, that it's just unheard of. Yeah. Um, so you have to applaud what they're doing oh, come uh, on. because if it, and, and so they go on to say this offers vocational training. So mm -hmm. they, they're, they're constantly trained, educated, mm -hmm. the peer counseling or mentoring, right, which we were talking about a little bit. Yeah. Uh, leadership training, transitional services. One of the things that we they, they what they call them games. Was that what it was? Games. I, I, I think I think it was when, when I think they did, but it, it didn't stick with me no. because it was like a therapeutic conversation. So my language right. probably yeah. got stuck. Uh, maybe with that's me, a way. But to, I think it was called. Games, but it, but they would make each other accountable for behavior. So attitudes Correct. and behaviors were challenged all the time. So if you're walking by somebody, and and they give you attitude, or you know, there's a, a, a rebellion, rebellious spirit in some way that takes place, you're called on it right yeah. away, and. You gathered in a community room, which mm -hmm. is really cool because they also play games. They do all kinds of fun things there. Yeah. I'm sure they eat there and they cook for themselves and all this. But mm -hmm. uh, you're you're told not told off. I don't want to say it that way, but it kind of is. Like you're mm -hmm. you're you're held to, to, to a pretty high standard mm -hmm. because your peers know. Like you're not getting anything over on them. They've yeah. all been there. They've been part of this process. They know what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's lying <laughs> or, or just pretending or posing. Yeah, you know that they make them accountable yeah. for it. And you know, I don't know if there's a three strike you're out rule. Whatever it looks like, you certainly can't continue down that path and be. Well, successful. it sounds like. If uh, you have too much of that behavior, they send you back to the bench to think about, yeah. do you really want to do this or not? <laughs> yeah. um, one of the gentlemen we talked to, I think, said he was sent back twice, mm. and now he's kind of a model student there. Yeah. But you know, but sometimes it takes that to really say, do I really want this? Because you're confronted. Here's where you know Steve is the one who really has introduced me. Um, to Joseph Granny and Crucial Conversations. I don't know if introduced. I think I was aware, but not the depth of what Crucial Conversations mm -hmm. really brings to the workplace, if you use it correctly. And, you know, you're training um, a number of our staff and just having me really pay attention. I have never seen such a great example yeah. of crucial conversations in this community because they did a role play for us yeah. and yeah, showed right. us exactly what, what that, that would like. look yep. like. Yep. And boy, it's tough. Like I'm just thinking, you know, of people that I've worked with in the past and how, my gosh, I don't know how many of them would have been able to stand up to the very direct. It's kind of like you're really seeing into the other person because it was you at one point. And so there's so much um, humility, accountability, right. but also grace yeah. in this model. But you see crucial con conversations you at do. play in a therapeutic community is just so neat. And there's a deep desire among the students to succeed. You can yes. you can tell there it is. You know you're 
the attitude coming in, if you sit on a bench for a couple hours and think mm -hmm. about it and you stay, because you can walk out the front door if you don't want to stay. Yeah. Uh, of course, that might land you back in prison or some other place. But mm -hmm. there is a I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired yes. attitude that that those that are, that are coming into the program, because not everybody would succeed if you mm -hmm. have this uh, sort of free flowing way about you that doesn't want to get well by raising your hand, you're not going to succeed. So what is fascinating to me is just how committed and then, man, once you see the success of it, then in your own life, I could, you, any of us can put ourselves in a situation. Uh, there's a, the humility comes with it, but there's a sense of spirit of, I don't want, I don't want to use the word pride, but it is a sense of accomplishment yes. uh, that you that these guys have um, and gals because there's mm -hmm. a mixed community here which was yeah. funny by the way they aren't allowed to talk to each other the men and women for how long is it like uh, i don't remember their number a few months or something I, well it could even be it up to a, a year longer. yeah sorry tosa yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Met, but you know it, it's an interesting thing that um in drug and alcohol communities mm -hmm. they ask for a year right. that you don't get into a relationship because we're using embracing brokenness terms yep. anything you put in the god spot that's not god is going to be a problem you are going to go from addiction to addiction to addiction Correct. so yep. you solve one thing but you run to the next thing and now you have something else speaking into your identity um, versus you really doing the deep dive discovery of who you are and now you think you're going to be okay the next thing you know that relationship breaks up you relapse i mean it is so common and so you know they had um a principle that i would equate to what we call you know and again i'm drawing some parallels to our model guys i'm hoping that you hear not about this unique therapeutic community model for people with addictions my hope would be that you're hearing in terms of embracing brokenness mm -hmm. terms we are all broken we're all broken by sin it manifests in many different right. ways you know and so um th this kind of community is what i believe has many um, elements of what the kingdom will look like um yeah. in terms of you know we're all made in god's image he's a triune god highly relational the honoring of social connectedness where drug and alcohol addictions are very isolating mm -hmm. but how many kinds of addictions you know even if you're a workaholic i mean all the things that we struggle with have that component of hiding and posing um and so you know just really fascinating that this could be for you because you we can all learn from some of the the practices and actually their core beliefs that they put into place and uh developing this community because then the values th that they hold closely mm -hmm. are shared at that point so Amen. there's a couple of them here this is good so i want to just so they have 12 i would call it foundational um, tenants or values or whatever mm -hmm. you would call it. I mentioned one, you alone can't do it, but but you can't do it alone. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, make and keep promises. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's important. So these are things you're going to get called out on. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's been mistakes made yep. in all these areas. Self-reliance, there is no free lunch. Okay, so, so it really requires people to take personal responsibility, like yeah. what Dave said in the opening. You've, you've got it. You've you just have to take on your own personal responsibility. Though yeah. yes, things happen to us when we were younger, but mm -hmm. ultimately, as an adult, you know, we're, we there are consequences to behaviors, and this is yeah. what has to happen. And, and what was interesting, um, one of the gentlemen who took us on the tour, mm -hmm. um, and again, we're we're trying to not use names because right. that just doesn't feel appropriate, especially. Um, it's their story but what was shared so many times now we hear people's stories of trauma or what they came up through and that's and we say oh that's horrible and that allows them to be victims versus victors their model really is sure they're all a piece of you i think you could hear it um when dave was even speaking like i was a burden and you know um but I have to be part of the solution now, right? right? And so you heard that, 
The interesting thing is that the gentleman, one of the gentlemen we were touring, um, was able to name most of the social determinants of health is how I would describe them. But the things that led him to extreme brokenness or even developmental delays, I mean, they're mm -hmm. just things he didn't have, he didn't learn. There was no way that he used that as, as, as an excuse. He didn't try to make an excuse. In fact, he was very clear it wasn't an excuse. He said, but these are the reasons that I turned to drugs and alcohol and I now need to learn all these things. I am responsible for my own life. Right. Huge if we would hold people to that, you know. Um, young children, different story. But once you're an adult, you're treated as an adult, you get adult responsibilities and you've got to own your own life. And so that was pretty impressive. Yeah, and, and more on that, impeccable honesty is part of that. So the, the thing that the number five, act as if, do you recall? Well, you know, it's funny because at first when I saw that, I thought about the manifesting something. And I really dislike that whole thing of I'm going to manifest it. Well, no, nope, God's going to give it to you as a gift. Right. However, the way they use it is not the manifesting. Um, I think it's a really cool cognitive behavioral therapy. I remember in sports um, growing up, we had a guy who was getting into sports psychology. He was a, one of the coaches and he would actually have us visualize mm -hmm. a cross country course and how we were gonna hit different places at different marks. And um, so act as if is you set a goal, right. um, you either look to people who kind of have been there and ascribe to that, or more importantly, you align your behaviors well, if I'm going to be an attorney, I have to wear a suit and be to work on time and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And so you act as if you are the thing yes. you want to accomplish. Yes. So the way they use it was not the whole kind of weird yeah. manifest things, yeah. but it was really like aligning with your goals in a really positive way. So I really like that. Yeah. And they were, and one of the young men just simply, I think maybe even both of them said they're, they're one of their primary goals was to be on the staff yes. at uh, the other side academy. And yeah. I have no doubt that when we go back there someday, we'll see at least one of them there yeah. on staff. And that is an act as if. Yeah. And I love that. Well, <laughs> and the one who really wants to be on staff has given been given charge of their educational programs. Right. He was so articulate. Mm -hmm. And when we talked to him, I mean, I don't even remember if he didn't get past sixth grade or something um, for a life on the streets. He was not schooled. No, he got his GED and while he was he there. He got his GED mm -hmm. there and then went on. Like, And he said every chance he had for education, he loved it. And you're looking at this young man going, you would have ne never had a clue. No, and what I also the community helps support that. One of the banks, yes. if you remember in Denver, one of the banks, or there's either matching actually scholarship programs yes. to continue education yes it, it is well i'll tell you what kudos joseph and Sila, because this you know look he had a successful model in business with mm -hmm. uh you know crucial learning you know world renowned in many mm -hmm. ways he worked with a thousand of the biggest companies around the world in behavioral right. science he's taken what he learned there and he applied it in this world to help further you know, the lives of so many other people. And if you want to learn more about the history, it's on their website mm -hmm. too. So go there. Uh, embrace humility. Mm -hmm. We mentioned that. Really mm -hmm. important. This was one they kind of parroted, right? Each one, teach one. Yep. So everybody's responsible for teaching the other. Yes. I, you know what? Take note. This is important for all of us in all of our lives. Yeah. To be each one teach one. We we can learn. I don't care what age we are. We can learn from one another. They mm -hmm. were modeled that. You could see it. I mean, they were yeah. hard at work. We saw students. Many of them were out, obviously, in their social enterprise responsibility mm -hmm. that day. But there were many around there that were, you know, cleaning and sweeping and doing other things, working in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, as Denver followed us around, one uh, we had. I think there were three gals who were on the phone bank. Yes. Uh, looking for gift in kind so yes. they had leads people that were interested and they would call different mm -hmm. businesses and part mm -hmm. of their responsibility as a student was to to solicit or actually get people who would give them something 
mm-hmm. that would help further their their cause. I, I thought yeah. that was awesome. And what was so cool was you just didn't have some terrified person no. having to sit and pick up a phone no. and do something they'd never done before. That's right. where the each one teach one. Mm-hmm. You know, you could see one person was teaching someone else. Remember when we went to the kitchen? And you had, you know, the one guy and he's teaching just a basic thing, cutting yeah. carrots or whatever it was. And they, you could just see these principles are not on a piece of paper, but they're yeah. actually active. Like they just train up the next person. And so it takes that intimidation factor out of it and such up for success. It was yeah, really good. It, it does. So to, to, so as we continue to move through this, I'm just going to read these. And you guys, again, you all can take a look on their mm-hmm. site. But... 200% accountability, that's 100% mm-hmm. on both sides, right? Yeah. F- forgiveness, which is key Huge. to any relationship. Amen. Boundaries, we all have to set boundaries yep. uh, and keep them. Set them yep. and keep them. Yep. Really responsible people and do again, that. And again, the role play showed us yeah, uh, right. an example of a boundary violation. And mm-hmm. again, they're taught to say, this was a boundary violation against me, or this is what I expect for a relationship. Perfect. <laughs> yes, yes, so yeah, they're modeling yeah. and role playing these things. Oh, and yeah. one of them was like, "Hey, you're on the moving team, right? Because yeah. they're moving, to, and you, all you're doing is carrying around pillows instead of you, <laughs> instead of getting I, up I on the truck." I would have tried to get away with that. That would be you. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. I, you get the piano, I'll get the bench. Yeah, yeah that kind of thing. Go. So, <laughs> all the way down to their work. Making yeah. each other accountable. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are faith friendly. So mm-hmm. I love that because, you know, Joseph, when we had him, I, know I had him on the podcast. He talked, mm-hmm. we, we, we talked a lot about our faith and, yes. and how important that is to living out this life mm-hmm. in this, in the, from a kingdom perspective. And we've mentioned it before. Number 12 here is pride in your work. So that mm-hmm. means not just doing, not looking for the easy way out, but doing mm-hmm. it with excellence. And yeah. you can see it because oh, it was my. spotless. Their, Their bathrooms were spotless. Rooms? Uh, I could not believe. It was like military. Oh, it was incredible. Uh, all right, you get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. what we're this is what we've we've experienced and I think there's so much more we could do to talk about this. Yeah, we probably could talk for 10 hours. We probably about could. This program. We probably could, but I but our goal was to to allow people to get give you all an opportunity to plug in a little more to what TOS is doing to be able to be uh, aware that there are programs like this available, but mm-hmm. encourage others to look into them in their own community and mm-hmm. even uh, to support what the Other Side Academy is doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Joseph and I talked in Salt Lake City, there is a, um, a village that will be built right in the yes. next couple of years called the Other Side Village. We will definitely be going we to visit. We will be visiting so Salt Lake City and see how they do it. Tosa, Denver, and I mean Tosa, uh, Salt Lake, and Tosa the other side village Mm -hmm. which i think was more for people who experience homelessness or have mental health issues it's it was almost like a tiny home village it was really a cool community absolutely that they're 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 putting together and so there's more on that you can find out there's so much here yeah yeah uh carl what else how would you want to tie it up in a bow here for as we're for our listeners is there something we want to we want to bring well I, i will say you know as a therapist it's always interesting to go to models where they don't have therapists and they just have peer support. And mm. I will tell you, I have seen over and over again, but but this probably was the place where I was like, I so agree with running peer supports and getting therapists out of the way and drug and alcohol. And I can only give you my personal experience. And hopefully this is helpful too. Um, as people were even thinking about where do you donate money to, everybody's looking for, well, what is this evidence? Oh, they have all these therapists, so they're better. Well, here's the deal. As a person who grew up in a white uh, middle-class home, I certainly have a lens through which I see the world. And what I want everybody to realize is somebody is not just struggling with addiction. Here really is what's happening to a person who is fighting with an addiction, but it's because other factors have really hindered development in certain ways. So socially, you know, you have somebody who shows up for therapy with a sense of entitlement, they're irresponsible, they lack trust, they're inconsistent, they're unaccountable, okay? 
that is not come to my office, pay me, you know, yeah. or go to a program if those things cannot be addressed. You know, I may say just straighten up. Cognitive and behaviorally, they have very poor judgment, very poor awareness, difficulties in making decisions. They don't have problem solving schools and they lack education or vocational skills. Their perception is pretty negative on themselves, probably on other people, on their identity, and they have low self-esteem. But emotionally, they usually are delayed developmentally. They can have just problems associated mm. with just maturing, um, low threshold to even understand emotional cues. That kind of reminds me of, of people who are on the spectrum with autism. Like they're not gonna take in the same cues the way other people would. Um, and you know, again, you see all kinds of emotional dysregulation and behavioral boundaries. So me as a therapist coming from a very different cultural viewpoint is not really the person to treat them because you can already see my biases are gonna come. I This is a whole huge ball of things that need to be pulled apart and addressed. Absent a therapeutic community mm -hmm. with people who have been there and get it, um, it's really, really hard for our traditional uh, drug and alcohol models to work. And so this to me was really where I said, yep, once again, I am proven that um, done correctly because there's a lot of peer-based communities that are mm -hmm. done because it makes services cheaper. There's a whole lot of reasons done correctly. This is the best model, yeah. Well, that's a wrap. Uh, so yeah. listen, uh, if you want to learn more, about the Other Side Academy. Again, in the show notes, there'll be a link to the website. There will also be uh, some other resources that might be available to you there. Mm -hmm. So go check it out. I would encourage you, if this resonates with you, support them. I mean, they're, they're a community that requires, they're a nonprofit that, that really would appreciate any support you could provide them mm -hmm. as we uh, understand. Uh, yes. You know, as we embrace our brokenness, there are people out there attempting mm -hmm. to do the same and to, to get a leg up on the mm -hmm. world that we live in. And boy, I'll tell you what, it's pretty impressive. Yep. Those guys were really well well uh, educated and certainly appreciating the gift, uh, in this mm -hmm. case, that God gave them through this organization. So blessings, everyone. Mm -hmm. We will see you next time on the Embracing Brokenness podcast. Mm -hmm. This was another episode of the Embracing Brokenness podcast. For more information on Embracing Brokenness Ministries or to subscribe to our blog, podcast, YouTube channel, or engage with us on social media, please visit our website at embracingbrokenness.org. Thanks for joining us.